Welcome to Music History Monday for May 16th, 2022. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is The Phoenix Rises. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the opening on May 16th, 1792, 230 years ago today, of Venice's principal opera house, the Teatro La Fenice, meaning the Phoenix Theater. Excepting, perhaps, the magnificent phallus that is the Washington Monument, dedicated as it is to the father of our country, rarely, if ever, will a building be better named than La Fenice, which has risen from the ashes three times. Background. The first public opera house, the Teatro San Cassiano, opened in Venice in 1637. Public opera quickly proved to be tremendously popular and immensely profitable, and Venice, already the tourist capital, the Las Vegas of the European world, had yet another recreational activity to offer its endless stream of visitors. By 1700, there were some 20 opera theaters operating in Venice, cranking out operas the way Hollywood cranked out movies in the pre-television glory days of the 1930s and 1940s. As the popularity of public opera spread first across Italy and then all of Europe, so opera theaters were built across Europe. No longer the singular purveyor of public opera, many of Venice's opera houses closed, so that by 1770, only five remained. Of those five, the most plush and the most prestigious in terms of its productions was the Teatro San Benedetto, which had opened in 1755. Sidebar, opera house fire safety. In the 17th century, 18th century, and first half of the 19th century, theaters of every stripe burned down with alarming regularity. This should come as no surprise, as candles and oil lamps, open flames, were employed in prodigious number to light both the stage and the house. Some of these flammables were placed in rows at the front edge of the stage with mirrored reflectors behind them to light the stage. This row of lights was called the footlights. Other such lights illuminated the stage from above and from the sides. These were called, respectively, border lights and strip lights. Boys were employed to scamper around during a performance, regulating the lights and cleaning up the candle wax that dripped and ran and created smoke. Given that these theaters were built from wood, covered in fabric and paper mache and were occupied during a performance by musicians, performers, stagehands, and such, constantly scurrying around on stage and backstage, it is difficult to imagine a less fire-safe environment outside of an active volcano. Frankly, it's something of a miracle that any theater survived at all before the use of reliable gas lighting around 1840. Back to Venice's elegant Teatro San Benedetto. It lasted for all of 19 years and burned down in 1774. The theater was rebuilt, but its reopening saw a power struggle between the powerful Venier family, who actually owned the land on which the theater was built, and the opera box owners who had previously collectively run the theater. The Venier family decided that it wanted to run the rebuilt theater, and they had the political influence and monetary clout to wrest control of the theater from the box owners. This was the 18th century equivalent of a modern stadium owner booting out the multimillionaires 
who lease the luxury boxes. Being the opera fanatics that they were, these very rich box owners simply banded together and built an opera house of their own, which they named La Fenice, the phoenix, the bird that rises alive from its own ashes. La Fenice. Construction began on the Fenice in 1788, and it opened four years later on May 16, 1792, 230 years ago today. Fire struck in December of 1836. However, gratefully, the theater was not entirely destroyed, and it reopened 12 months later, on December 26, 1837. By that time, it had become the single most important opera venue in Venice. Meanwhile, the rebuilt Teatro San Benedetto, renamed the Teatro Venier for the fat cat family that owned it, came to be considered an insignificant third-rate venue. Converted into a movie house in 1937, the Cinema Rossini, it closed its doors in 2010. It is now known as the Teatro Concordia and is owned and run by the city of Venice and used for special events. Back to the rebuilt Phoenix Theatre. With a capacity of 840, the Fenice was small even by contemporary standards and tiny by modern standards. By comparison, the Teatro Calon in Buenos Aires seats 2,500. The Metropolitan Opera in New York City seats 3,850. The Sydney Opera House seats 5,738. Physically small the Fenice might be, but in terms of artistic prestige, only La Scala in Milan, with its 2,030 seats, could boast more important operatic premieres in the 19th and 20th centuries. Here is a short list of operas heard for the first time at the Fenice. Gioacchino Rossini's Tancredi, Sigismondo, and Semiramidi. Giacomo Meyerbeer's Il Crociato in Egitto. Vincenzo Bellini's I Capolette e i Montecchi and Beatrice di Tenda. Gaetano Donizetti's Belisario and Pia di Tolomei. Giuseppe Verdi's Ernani, Attila, Rigoletto, La Traviata, and Simon Boccanegra. Ruggero Leoncavallo's La Boheme, Pietro Mascagni's Le Maschere, Igor Stravinsky's The Rake's Progress, and Benjamin Britten's The Turn of the Screw. And for our information, the Italian premiere of Richard Wagner's epic ring cycle took place at the Fenice in 1883. January 30th, 1996. The fall and early winter of 1995 and 1996 saw the Teatro La Fenice undergoing major renovations. It was due to reopen on March 1st, 1996, with a concert by Woody Allen and his New Orleans jazz band. As often happens with big projects contracted out to many different companies, work on the renovation was uneven. In particular, a small electrical company owned by a Venetian named Renato Carella had fallen badly behind schedule. Presumably, to hide their lack of progress, Carella's son, Enrico Carella, and his nephew, Massimiliano Marchetti, decided to start a small fire. Well, not a big fire, just enough so that they could avoid paying a penalty for their delay by blaming the fire. At their trial, the prosecutor Felice Casson brought the case against Corelli and Marchetti. In his wonderful book, The City of Falling Angels, John Berendt recounts, quote, Casson told the story of the fire in meticulous spellbinding narrative, the workers leaving the theater at the end of the day, Carella pouring solvent on a pile of planks of wood upstairs in preparation for setting the fire later on. Corella and Marchetti 
hiding as the last workman left, Carella using a blowtorch to ignite the fire while Marchetti stood lookout, the fire creeping, then roaring through the theater." Unquote. A link is provided to a heartbreaking video of the fire and the vain effort to rescue La Fenice from the Venetian television channel Televenezia. The old theater, with its wooden roof, fabric seats and curtains, and paper mache decor, was already a fire trap. Thanks to the renovation, it was now also full of paint, solvents, ethanol, plastics, and lumber. Once the fire started, there was, in fact, no chance of putting it out, and Venice's firefighters had to focus on localizing the blaze, which, heroically and magnificently, they did. But the Fenice was lost, and when the smoke cleared on January 31st, 1996, all that remained was the roofless shell of the once magnificent theater. It took five years to condemn Carella and Marchetti, who were finally convicted of arson in 2001. However, many people, including the judges who convicted Carella and Marchetti, were convinced that there was a larger conspiracy behind the fire. Their motivazioni, their explanation on how they reached their verdict, contained this statement, quote, Carella and Marchetti were not alone. They were surrogates for others who remained in the shadow, people with financial interests of such magnitude that, by comparison, the sacrifice of the theater would have seemed a small thing." Unquote. The evidence of dastardly intent, though circumstantial, was powerful. Someone had unplugged the building's smoke alarm and heat sensors at some point before the fire. The sprinkler system had been dismantled and not yet replaced. The single guard tasked with overseeing the building did not appear until 9.20 p.m., a full 20 minutes after the first alarm had been called in. The canal next to the Fenice, from which fire crews would have pumped water, had been illegally drained for dredging. Writes John Berendt, quote, People who had been involved with the renovation of the Fenice described the worksite as chaotic. Security doors had been left unlocked or even wide open. People came and went as they pleased, authorized or not. Copies of the keys to the front door had been handed out haphazardly, and several were unaccounted for." Unquote. For details on who would have profited from the theater's destruction and why, I would highly recommend Barron's book, The City of Falling Angels, Penguin Press, 2005. For our information, the falling angels evoked in the title refer to the sculptures, many of them of angels, that routinely fall from the facades of Venice's magnificent but dilapidated churches. Reaction For the Venetians, who had always outnumbered the tourists at the Fenice, the loss of the theater was a civic catastrophe. The morning after the fire, the headline on the front page of Venice's principal newspaper, Il Gazzatino, declared, Never again! The cry to rebuild was taken up internationally. In Venice, the prostitutes took up a collection and presented the mayor, Massimo Cacciari, with a check for 1,500 euros. Luciano Pavarotti announced that he would give a benefit concert for the Fenice. Not to be upstaged, Placido Domingo announced that he too would stage a concert, though his concert would be held in St. Mark's Basilica there in Venice. Pavarotti then declared that he would sing at St. Mark's as well, though he would perform the entire concert by himself without any other singers. Meanwhile, Woody Allen, who had been slated to reopen the Finice on March 1, 1996, behaved like Woody Allen. He quipped that, quote, a lover of good music, unquote, must have started the fire, and, quote, if they didn't want me to play, 
All they had to do was say so, unquote. In fact, Woody Allen adores Venice, and he came to the city anyway, playing a benefit concert at the Goldoni Theater for the Fenice. Given a tour of the ruin by Mayor Cacciari, Allen was deeply moved, saying, quote, Terrible. Terrifying. It's total devastation. It's unreal. Unquote. Rebuild. From the beginning, the intent was to rebuild the Teatro La Fenice exactly as it had been. Comera, dovera. As it was, where it was. A completion date was set, 2003, seven years after the fire. Rebuild, yes, though easier said than done. Especially in Italy, where contracting is a contact sport, and especially, especially in Venice, where erecting a crane and getting the requisite construction materials, including steel girders and concrete, to the building site was next to impossible due to the layout of the city, the nature of the canals, and the subsequent lack of transport corridors. I would tell you now that it is far beyond the scope of this post to even come close to describing the comedy or tragedy, you pick, of errors, delays, politicking, legal issues, graft, financial malfeasance, and pure incompetence that marked the first four years of the rebuild from 1996 to 2000. And then a blessed savior forth cometh. His name was Paolo Costa, born 1943, an economist who had served as Italy's Minister of Public Works. He was elected mayor of Venice in 2000. On becoming mayor, he made an unannounced inspection tour of the construction site at the Fenice. He found precisely one person on the job. The newly elected mayor Costa demanded to be appointed the commissioner in charge of the reconstruction, which made him directly responsible for the success or failure of the project. Costa discovered that while 60% of the time to completion of the project had already elapsed, just 5% of the actual reconstruction had taken place. He proceeded to fire the joint German-Italian partnership of Holtzmann Romagnoli that had been hired to do the reconstruction. Holtzman Romagnoli refused to leave the work site. Mayor Costa sent in the police, who physically removed them and their equipment. The project was again put out to bid, and Costa chose the Venetian firm of Sakim, a firm very familiar with the unique challenges of building in Venice. In early March of 2002, with yet another year gone, but with construction finally ready to resume, Mayor Costa had erected outside of the Fenice a large digital clock, one that would count down the days until the November 3, 2003 construction deadline. When work resumed on March 11, 2002, the clock showed 630 days to completion. In those 630 days, hundreds of construction workers Plasterers, artists, woodworkers, and craftspeople labored 24 hours a day, seven days a week to rebuild the theater. Based on the 1837 plans and photographs, the interior of the theater was lovingly recreated using the same materials employed in that first rebuild, seasoned wood for proper acoustics, and paper mache, plaster, and gold leaf, among many other materials, for the ornamentation. However, for all of its period detail, the infrastructure of the rebuilt La Fenice is entirely modern. The box of the theater itself is enclosed in a larger box of masonry and reinforced concrete, which is itself framed by steel beams and a steel roof. State-of-the-art stage equipment electrical systems, sprinklers, and plumbing have replaced the jury-rigged systems that had existed before the fire 
And when the orchestra pit is not called for, the capacity of the auditorium can now be increased to 1,124. I've been fortunate enough to attend three opera performances in the rebuilt Finice, each one special. The intimacy and sheer beauty of the theater are breathtaking, and the sound is exquisite. Attending a performance there should be a bucket list item for every one of us. Viva la Fenice! Long live the Phoenix! However, enough of this rising from the ashes stuff. Let the present three such risings be the charm. Please. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.